I want to welcome you all to Chapter End Notes. This month, we're going to discuss one of my favorite books of all time, and that is The Group by Mary McCarthy. And why have we selected this book at this time? When an editor suggested to Candace Bushnell that she write, quote, the modern day version of the group, unquote, she wrote Sex in the City. Bushnell now summarizes what, how she feels about the group. Quote, the group reminds us that not much has really changed, unquote. The book, The Group, paved the way for films such as The Big Chill, obviously the essays, uh, TV shows, and uh, films, uh, um, Sex and the City. If you watched Gilmore Girls, which I've never watched, it's said to be influenced by this book. In Mad Men season three, there is an episode where they talk about the group. And even Philip Roth mentions Mary McCarthy and the group in one of his books. Why did I des decide to assign this for our, uh, our selection this past summer? Because it was time. This is a book that's brilliantly written in vivid detail. We have everything from mortifying experiences to visit a gynecologist, to cigarettes, martinis flowing, and the intricacies of certain types of interior designs that must be um, analyzed when walking through Macy's and Bloomingdale's. We have happy hour taking place on a maternity ward floor, and people are smoking like chimneys. I absolutely love this book. So what is this book about? We have eight or nine Vassar graduates, depending on your source. They've graduated in 1933, and these women are armed with their ideas. Realize the group itself is a protagonist. Through each chapter, we weave in and out of themes that McCarthy weaves in, including birth control, workplace behavior, unfaithfulness, job satisfaction, mental health, in, uh, infidelity, secrets, pregnancy, casseroles, friendships, fear, interior design, brace, breastfeeding, racism, uh, curtains, communism, bigotry, recipes, self-discovery, and even sexual assault. This composite voice is the voice of Mary McCarthy. The ideas are instilled in the girls, in the group, uh, from their professors at Vassar, just like McCarthy was influenced. Scholars have identified at least four of the group members who are real life graduates of Vassar. Can you imagine? Um, as well as recognizable, recognizable composites that she took from many of her friends. So more on that later. So who is in the group? We have Lakey, Helena, Dottie, Pokey, Libby, and Pris, Polly, and Kay. We also have Noreen, but depending on your source, whether she's included or not in this, um, in the group. But we also have some sympathetic um, participants. Um, we have their families who support them and we meet some of the family members of some of the women in the group. And then we also have the antagonists. No doubt you know who these people are. They are all male. Uh, they are husbands, lovers, friends, butlers, and assorted acquaintances. How is the stage set for the group? We are all invited to a wedding. Quote, we see, oh, excuse me, we see everyone lined up in the pews. And here's what Mary tells us about the group. They knew they had something to contribute to our emergent America and were not afraid of being radical. They could see the good Roosevelt was doing. And despite what mom and dad had said, even the most conservative of them pushed to the wall, admitted that an honest socialist was entitled to a hearing. 
The worst fate they utterly agree would be to become like mother and dad, stuffy and frightened. As though to underscore this unconventionality of older persons, even Kay's parents were absent from the wedding. So we're there with them in the pews. It's almost like we're just a row behind them, overhearing them. And we hear their excitement and their concern about this unconventional wedding of Kay and Harold with an A. And the reader is introduced to each character by their comments in the pews. So by page eight, by page eight, we come to what I feel is one of the most amazing quotes in literature. Here's the series. They're looking, right? They're looking at Kay and Harold and they're looking around the church. One says, who would have thunk it? What perfect pets they look. Not too bad, said another, except for the shoes. When I read, except for the shoes, the first time I read this book, I realized I could be hit by a truck and still be happy. The entire personality, this acerbic wit, I fell in love with. So I ask you, do you feel that Mary McCarthy has contempt for these characters or sympathy? Did you have a favorite? Was there someone you have liked to have canceled or erased from your memory? Who do you think was most likely to succeed and why? And what does the book represent? Do you judge them through your present day lens or are you sympathetic to these women and who they are then? And who are the women? And notice their names. Kay Strong. Her, the narrative begins and ends with her. She serves as this focal point. So all the characters are coming in and out of the story through Kay's experience. She is every woman. The girl next door who wants to co conquer New York. She's an outsider from the Midwest. She works at Macy's. And she cares about material stuff like curtains. And then slowly she erodes as she grows more remote chapter by chapter. In case you are wondering, and I don't mean for this to be a spoiler, Mary McCarthy, much like Nella Larson, intentionally leaves unanswered the question of whether Kay's death was an accident or the result of suicide. I'd be curious to hear what you have to say. So she's married to Harold with an A who delights in gaslighting and manipulation. And then we have the deflowered Dottie Renfew one of my favorite characters in this book was Dottie's mother, but more on that later. Mary McCarthy is ruthlessly cynical with this Boston proper type of character. Dottie is our most devout. She dotes and traditional of the characters. And her experience that happens in chapter two, early in the book, truly is what is responsible for the book's notoriety. She decides just two nights after Kay and Harold's wedding that it's time for her sexual initiation, thanks to Masters and Johnson. Dottie's thoughts through her initial sexual experience keep flitting affectionately to who? Quote, mother, class of 1908, who would probably understand, though she might be startled, that there'd been no thought of love on either side. This was racy stuff when this book was published in 1963. What's amazing is after that, her boyfriend, Dick Brown, uh, tells her that uh, things would be a lot better between them if she would go see a lady doctor because he prefers diaphragms for upper-class women and condoms for lower-class women. 
We are a fly on the wall of what it was like to be female in the 1930s. This book is like a time capsule. It's so fabulous. One of the funniest parts of the book to me is when Kay and, um, and Dottie visit a gynecologist so she can be fitted. Who knew that contraceptives could fly across a room? Next, we have Polly, who is the lab tech. We have Mary Pokey Protherio. Uh, she's the one that made the shoes comment. Then we have who I would call postpartum Pris. The names are just outstanding. We have Noreen Schmidtlap Blake Rogers, a very, very complicated character who to me is definitely not a member of the group. Then you'll remember Libby, who's our literary agent, who always repairs to shrafts for a malted after work. Then there is Helena Davidson, our Helen of Troy. The author tells us that though uh, how Helena thinks that she can make things right, how she knows, you know, she's so in charge. At one point, she is in Noreen's apartment which is described as living in a squalid apartment that smells, quote, of soured dishcloth. And she noticed the bedding. It must be like rolling in a rich, moldy compost of autumn leaves crackling on the surface. And she says that Noreen should fix her life by just cleaning the house, scrub the floor, buy some real food. Obviously, Helena thinks she has all the answers. One character who has very little to say, but has a huge presence in the book, is our Lakey, Eleanor Eastlake. She is definitely the leader. Lakey Eleanor, clearly a nod to Eleanor Roosevelt. An amazing character we can discuss. Both Lakey's arrival and Kay's death are, although separated by time, are both related to war events. Lakey in Europe, because of the war, has to return to America. And Kay allegedly spotting for German uh, aircraft ends the book. So this is a story that takes place in a time period where America is bookended between two wars. Frankly, the men are quite unflattering. Uh, we have Harold with an A. Uh, we have Gus Leroy, who is a walking advertisement for never, ever going into psychoanalysis. Uh, we have um, Nils, the Norwegian, who's just disgusting. Uh, we have Putnam Blake, who is impotent. I think that is a riff on blank. Dick Brown, no more need be said. And Dr. Sloan Crockett, who to me, probably is a reference to our crock of fill in the blank. Uh, and so it goes. I just love her use of names in this book. So in summary, the members of the group face a burden of limited opportunities and of men who make their lives all but unbearable. This vaster education a la Mona Lisa smile provides women with intellectual views which they aren't really mature enough to fully understand, but they insist on implying what they've learned into their lives. Therefore, in a way, almost all the characters scholars say fail. I'll be interested to know if you agree. Kay has a nervous breakdown and may well have taken her own life. Dottie abandons her career as a social worker and her dreams of romance, settling for a bourgeois, respectable man from Arizona. Our title is full of um, irony. The uniqueness of Mary, Marthy's, Mary McCarthy's group resides in the irony of the novel, that the group is both a friend and an enemy. She claims that it is not autobiographical. However, the research shows that there is no doubt 
that like any good writer, Mary writes about what she knows. I am going to leave it right here and ask you to um, unmute uh, and get your opinion of what you thought of the group. And wherever you want to go, I will go with you. So why don't we go ahead, Phyllis, I see you're unmuted. What did you think of this book? I'm so eager to know. I read 300 pages of it and put it aside. <laughs> I, like it. I, I read I, it twice. I, <laughs> you read it twice, okay. Go ahead, Phyllis. Kudos to you. Phyllis, we'll have Phyllis explain why it was an anathema and then we'll go to Diana to counter. I I found the characters very tedious. I found it too dated for me. It was it was and I found it too much detail about stuff I didn't care about. That's so interesting because for me it was like falling into like a time time, like having Hermione's time turner necklace. I was so excited to go back in time and be that fly in the wall. I wanted more detail. Like, are they using Lavoris or a scope invented yet? Like those were things I was like. That, that, Maybe that's the difference in our age. It, it could very well be, it could very well be. Um, but I appreciate you sharing that, I do. Uh, uh, Diana, go ahead. Okay, well, I I thought it, it I, I'd been waiting for this to 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 be assigned. Ah. It's it's one of the seminal books of women's literature. It it, it is at the beginning of a lot of, and she re, she she refused to be called a feminist, but come on, there is feminism there. She she explores women's lives, and in a way that. <laughs> We would love to see as a satire. It begins as a satire and it ends as a tragedy. So as we descend into the seriousness of these women's lives, um, we realize that it's not all fun and games. It is, um, it is a struggle for a modern woman to find an identity in this, in this uh, world that is rapidly changing. Um, they're the first generation that actually enters into jobs and they're not professions, they're jobs, a lot of them, um, and going to Macy's and, and, and learning merchandising or working for a nonprofit. So these are not the, the women, the, the generation that follows. This is my mother's generation. The, the, the following generation went into lawyering, lawyering and doctoring, and, but these women still are content with just working. And they're finding out how difficult it is to combine that with the rest of having to cook, having men who absolutely do not accept the, the, the equality of women, that, that some of them run circles around them in terms of intelligence and intellectual capacity. And um, Norman Mailer said, why are these women so passive? Come on, this generation had to had to assert themselves and, and they couldn't against the men who were, oh my God, I could have thrown Harold against the wall so many times. She yeah. should have. What a horror of a man. You Just know, it's very interesting. You the first verb you used when you talked about getting into this book is that we descend into their lives. And we, we don't explore, we don't do any of those verbs that um, are uplifting or revealing. We fall down with them. I just think that was, that was beautifully said. It shows the, the conflict, the, the conflict of messaging that was being sent to women then. And I would argue women now you know, go to school, get a degree, you know, I can f bring home the bacon, fry it up in a pan and never forget I'm a woman, Ajali, baloney, right? Uh, it, th this is the ground floor that builds up 
to that commercial that I remember seeing as a, you know, in the early 1970s. Martha. Okay. I, I mean, firstly, I have a group of friends. There are about eight of us. And I, I, I love this. Uh, I mean, I, I got Phyllis's notes, you know, like about the same time I was um, finishing the book. So I had finished it already. And I really like it. And then I listened to Mary McCarthy interviewed by Dick Cavett. She took out her cigarette yeah. and she's talking about it. And then I watched a little bit of the movie and she had already oh. said she didn't like the movie. And, and I hated it. just that little bit. They were sitting around the table. That was like not, not this. Um, I never watched Sex in the City. And it wasn't one of the things that I liked. But, but I think like um, Diana was saying, this is my mother's generation. My mother's 94 now. And she graduated from college, I think, in a little bit later than this. But she didn't have that group. She had some friends, but not like this. And, and one of the things that I made notes on, aside from all my other notes, were, were the help. The people that um, the colored maid that Polly had, the, the butler, the uh, maid that Aunt Julia, you know, that this is all these different people and how they kind of were around. And these were kind of women that were um, the next level up from, I mean, went to University of South Florida. We were sitting around on the floor doing these kind of talks and stuff, but these women were like, maybe, you know, they were used to like all this fancy stuff. Um, but I tend to like soap operas. I tend to like these kind of books. I tend to love like Peyton Place, which also I think came out around 63, kind of maybe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, I, but I had never read this before. It sounded a little familiar as I was going through it, but, you know, I never read the whole book. So. And, and those characters, like you said, some of those men were, were really terrible. I mean, you know, but they were, they were like impotent in a way, you know, like Harold, I mean, he was the actor, but he was probably whatever. And, and Leroy, the, the, pub, the, the publisher, you know, and, and going with his wife and then going for counseling, you know. Oh, right. that made me crazy. Yeah, okay, so that was my view. <laughs> well, um, I, I love, you always take notes, Martha, and I really appreciate that. And I like how you brought up that whole other group that I had not considered, but it was all the help. And they were from an upper class. They, these were wealthy uh, young women. We know that in that first chapter, again, when we're in the pews with them at St. George's uh, Church, because uh, they're like, oh my gosh, this is New York too? I didn't know this area. Look, like another, like, you know, they grew up whatever part of town they grew up in, and that was their world. Uh, they, they, and, and Mary, Mary was never a part of that. And I think that's evident, that, that's evident in the narrative voice. Lisa, do you want to um, share? Go ahead and unmute. I haven't read the book. I came on. I wanted to hear from you guys whether I should or not. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I was I was talking to a friend of mine who suffered through the film. There was a film in 66 by Sidney Lumet. And because we selected this from our for our reading, and no one else on planet Earth has selected this book, I guarantee you we're the only one. I'll guarantee it. I will, I will bet you all a dollar. Uh, all of a sudden, it's on Amazon Prime. Oh, well. Now, why does that happen? What is that? Is someone listening to us? Like, is someone channeling? I don't want to do you. Okay, <laughs> I need $5 million right away for... Like, <laughs> we should all plan on that, right? Hello, is anyone out there? Five, five. I take one, but... Five. I'm listening. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, anyway, so my friend watched the group with her daughter and um, she actually, I think she spoke about it on air this morning on WJCT, but it sparked a really interesting conversation. Diana was talking about how, you know, this is a definitely a feminist book, although Mary never took on that title. This book makes for great conversation. I would argue between mother and daughter and mother and son. This book is a whopper. It is 
full of discussion. And Phyllis, I realized that you come to it thinking it's a bit, it's just a bit much, but the perspective that I have makes me respect that generation even more because they all looked so perfect in the pictures, in the black and white pictures, you know, with their, uh, you know, Playtex girdles and all of that. But you know what, they're just as conflicted as we are and your daughters are. It, um, it, regardless of the rights we have or the rights taken away from us, uh, we, we struggle, we still struggle. And I feel a sisterhood that I did not feel before. And it, I thank that sisterhood to two things, books like the group, and when I feel that uh, my autonomy is threatened. And this is why I thought it is a good time to revisit this book. Uh, like I said, um, uh, I read this book many years ago and it was super hard to read in my own and digest because first of all, it's a little bit of a boring title. So who's gonna read that? Uh, uh, so I, um, and I had brought it to the book club before and no one picked it cause it sounds kind of boring, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I just felt the time was right. And I, you know, that um, I like to buy used books when possible, of course, from a local bookstore. And this particular group uh, book used, and you are not going to believe what I found in it. If you were with me when we did Wind, Sand and Stars, I found an amazing letter prior to World War II in that book, which just blew me away. So I get this book and out comes a an ad, a little uh, ad for Beltex roll-on garters. <laughs> look, look at this, look at this. How is this happening? Look, look at her. Not only do I get that, if you happen to be a Buckeye, if you happen to have lived in Ohio, or perhaps even more specifically, Northwest Ohio, where I grew up. If you turn this around and there is the price tag for our roll on cents from Lanson's <laughs> department store in Toledo, where my dad got the best winter coat one year for his birthday that my grandpa once walked out of the house with during an argument and he never saw that, that coat again. So the Lampson's coat is an it's infamy in my family. This is a, a, a famous story, part of my family. Like when I saw Lampson's 15 cents Toledo, it's like the thing with the group showing up on Prime. Why is this happening? What is this? Is there a way? I had no idea there was Lampson's in, in Ohio. I knew it from New York. Oh, okay. So evidently it was a, maybe it was part of Federated. I don't know. I don't know. But I don't even, is a roll on garter like the ones you wear in the wedding, in a wedding, like the rubbery thing, like, you know, you put on during the wedding and if people still do that, I don't know. If they well, do yeah, that. it holds up your stockings without having to wear garters. Okay. Pantyhose. Okay. Got it. I mean. Sphinx. I can't, I just, I don't know. I just thought whoever read this book back then used this for a book. Yeah, it was a bookmark. <laughs> <laughs> Only you. <laughs> you know, you know, you know. Okay, so um, I don't even know where I was going with, oh, Lisa. <laughs> I was rambling. Uh, Diane, why don't you unmute and tell us, um, uh, Lisa has not read the book yet, so this will be helpful. Was there a scene that stood out to you or you know, stayed with you or anything like that? Go ahead and um, unmute. Okay, I did. Um, there were several. Um, there were the politics, the politics of Trotskyism versus Stalinism that, uh, that some in the group, uh, Polly's um, uh, strange roommates, um, and and her uh, and her father um, that they they revolved around that that was interesting. Um, 
In the 30s, it was not unheard of that people were members of the Communist Party. It was not a terribly bad thing as it was 20 years later under McCarthyism. Um, um, I had a lot of friends in academia who said they were red diaper babies. And what that meant was that their parents were members of the Communist Party. And so they assumed their, their diapers were red. Uh -huh. <laughs> they grew up in, in households. So that was one theme. The other theme, of course, that jumps out is child rearing, um, breastfeeding. Uh, oh my God, that was, that was so, that spoke to me because I had, um, I had children, of course, uh, a, a few years later, but the issue hadn't been resolved, whether you breastfed or whether you gave the bottle, when you fed, how long you waited, did you let the baby cry? Did you pick him up? Did you coddle him? And I mean, that it, it, it's a historical document in that sense. I, I agree. Uh, that scene in the hospital. So there's a scene in the hospital, Pris, uh, and her husband, who is a pediatrician. And what you have is this push and pull between the mother's need. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, the mother's confusion after having the baby, not knowing who to listen to the nurse who's like, just give the baby a bottle. And the husband who knows, and you know, you, you do on a schedule and you, you, this is what you do. And frankly, Pris is not enjoying the breastfeeding because it hurts. And she's like halfway neurotic at this point. And meanwhile, when the husband comes to visit with, um, the mother, when they show up, they are literally smoking and having cocktails in her, in her room. It it's, and you're feeling like, like she's trying to entertain people and put on her lipstick before people show up. And she just had a baby. I mean, it is such a slice in time uh, that uh, really spoke to me. Another they, they also stayed in the hospital for like a week or 10 days or something. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. yeah, because you could do that, which is great. You know, we certainly, you know, you're walking out. You know, when the baby takes its first uh, <laughs> cry at this point. <laughs> I mean, right? Uh, so, um, another scene <laughs> that really spoke out to me. And then the relationship when she meets up with Noreen later. Yeah. And and in the park or whatever, and, and you know, the, the difference in their um, rapport, I get, or how they treat their kids. Right, and we have Maureen, who's like the hippy dippy, you know, yeah. the very lenient. Um, but those things of confusion never change. I came right. through the door in 1975 with my infant in my arms coming from the hospital and looked at my husband and said, now what do we do? Exactly. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> Ew, she I, was married to a pediatrician that was yeah, trying to exactly. get a point across. You know, he, yeah. he's trying to prove something and she's in pain. You know? right. right. He's running an experiment that's going to give him, you know, notoriety. Right. Right. You know, right. You know, meanwhile, she can barely. You if know, you think I am not sympathetic, this is what I have on. <laughs> <laughs> you got that. Okay. <laughs> uh, Noreen is interesting because she's like the counter to the group because she's never allowed in. She kind of recognizes that you you all were the popular girls. I was the odd man out. Uh, and um, she says, some, she, a quote of hers is, our Vassar education made it tough for me to accept my womanly role. She believes that education crippled her life. It was almost like by being educated, by being exposed by this, you know, what the world is all about. You want that, but you can't have it because you got to get married and have babies. That sounds like an excuse. And, and join the junior league. Well, it could be an excuse, but remember, Mary is writing, uh, you know, she's writing about people she knows. She's writing about people she knows. Yeah. I mean, She's a lucky. But she I also come from this from the point of view of people that I know. So, <laughs> right. Well, we all bring our own baggage, you know. Yes. Each book, uh, but uh, but to 
you know, the, they're trying to get jobs. They're being looked at, you know, their bodies are being analyzed. Uh, you know, there's that um, scene with Libby, um, who eventually becomes a literary agent, you know, and her, her, her boss, Gus, fires her. And what does he say? Quote, publishing is a man's business. Marry a publisher, Miss McGoslin, and be his hostess. No wonder Mad Men was a success. I mean, you, you're just, yeah, exactly. Exactly. This is why I couldn't read it. <laughs> I am, you know why? Because it, it, for you, it was just too close to home. Probably. Yeah, I think it was. But, but it's a literary document. It's, it's part of history. We were always told history should be taught from the perspective of. I'm of, part of history. Well, we are, but uh, this goes back further than you, I would think. Um, and it. Uh, but I couldn't I get around history. all the fonderall to get to the parts of the politics and the 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 other stuff. Well, we don't we don't have the patience anymore for very long books. I realize that <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Well, um, there, you know, there, there, uh, there, there's criticism. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and mute because I'm feeling some, um, I'm hearing some feedback. But there is criticism that for some, it just is too detailed. And, you know, reflecting what you're saying, Phyllis, either all the characters weren't fleshed out equally. For some reason in our books, we want full disclosure on all the characters. Yeah, right. It seems to be a constant criticism. Well, in defense of authors, maybe they don't want to talk about that guy so much or that girl so much. Get over it, move on. But for some reason, we want, you know, we want all of it. And, and it is a criticism. I Let have the tr same problem. I have the same problem with Ann Tyler's characters. I don't find them having redeeming qualities. It's hard to root okay, for okay. You know, it's hard to root for a character if you don't like them. Yeah. And are these characters likable? Nuh-uh. <laughs> I mean, none. Of, I wasn't really in that group for several reasons. <laughs> yeah. uh, I want to talk about Lakey. Uh oh. <laughs> I, I think, and um, what's fascinating to me is this made such a statement and was able to make a statement in 1963. But the reason why Lakey is in Europe because she's a lesbian and she can't live a full life in America. And it is only the threat of war that brings her back to the States. And it is a beautiful scene in all its detail when she arrives and the group all meet her at the, um, at the port. Is that the right term? Oh. And there she comes affectionately referring to her Baroness like the Baroness is such a stereotype, but I don't care. I love it anyway. Uh, and they all have this realization that she's not one of them. I think the term they used was, what Mary used was de trope. It was a French term like, uh-oh. <laughs> they realized that all their social plans they had for the day, they had to super duper reorganize super quickly, like a pachinko game, because because Lakey is a lesbian. Like, where do they put that in their world? Like, they have to rethink everything. And of course, the person who has to rethink it the most, which is the sucker punch at the end of the book, is Harold with an A. Uh, Kathy, I'd love to hear what you thought of the book. Um, if you could unmute and, and share your thoughts. Thanks. Um, you know, it was an interesting thing when I first started reading it. I literally, I, as you said, it, that whole first scene with the wedding and the shoes and the, I mean, you know, you definitely felt like you were watching, you know, something in action from the very first page kind of thing. Um, I, I found the book um, was so full of information. I mean, so full of descriptions. Um, the characters were, there were, there were so many of them. There were, they were rich. Um, and I did feel like we stepped back in time, but we were talking about 
things that we still talk about, you right. know, which right. was amazing in the fact that here we were talking about what what a woman's role was going to be. How how is an intelligent woman going to find her place in the world? You know, was she going to follow what her mother said? You know, or was she going to carve her own path? And was she going to encounter all these crazy men along the way? You know, that will sabotage her world and create all kinds of confusion. And yet, would those women really support each other? through the thick and thin, you know? Um, and so there was a lot of questions that it brought up about, not just about the characters we were reading, but about people's lives, you know, currently, you know, people's lives, you know, in terms of dealing with some of those issues. I, I felt like she, you know, I almost felt like the author, Mary, um, had gotten so, I mean, like almost in love with the characters, you know, she was sometimes the, in, and I can understand why, because I would take breaks from it too, because the descriptions would be so much that I'd be like, okay, I got to step away for a little bit and then, you know, um, and then come back to it. But I, um, but it was really thought provoking. Um, it was really, um, a, uh, you know, and sad, you know, you know, it was sad, you know, um, there were moments in time where I wanted the outcome to be totally different than it was. <laughs> Don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> there, there are no happy endings in this. There's reality, which is what exactly what Mary, you know, she's almost like a social historian, yeah. uh, in a way, because, uh, they're all left in very real situations. Yeah. And this is life. It's undone. It's messy. It's miscommunication. It's frustration. It's, you know, it's wonderful, but it's all of that stuff too. Yeah. And here is a novel that in great detail brings that uh, to us. Well, yeah. She was I, I think your description of her being more of a social historian I think was absolutely 100% accurate. That's exactly how it read. And, um, and she was prescient. Yes. And, you know, who knew when you're prescient, you know, but she was. Yeah. Which you is, don't foresee that, right? And I, if my math is right, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, this book in January will be 60 years old because it was published in January of 63. And if you think about where we are now as women, where we were then, when it was published, and what time frame it takes place in. This is the um, uh, an American female voice, which today, I'm not sure if we can use the word female and um, woman, because even that part of our identity is now being analyzed. It's too depressing. Well, let's look back in time because yes, Mary influenced, uh, you know, the um, popular references that I made at the beginning of our um, discussion. But this book comes in a long line of a literary genre I'd never heard of before. So I want to share it with you. This book is considered to be written in the tradition of what's called courtesy books, a didactic manual of knowledge uh, for courtiers, uh, courtiers, yeah, uh, to handle matter, matters of etiquette while at a royal court. These included what was socially acceptable behavior, personal morals, and especially upon um, life in the royal court. These types of stories date back to the 13th century. They all the way through the Middle Ages, and a lot of them were thematic. Some could just deal with religion, ethics, social awareness, philanthropy, social conduct. And if we fast forward, Jane Austen is considered someone who writes courtesy books. And if you think about what happens to the characters in her book, albeit they have much happier endings 
These are women dealing with limited choices. They are faced with financial issues. They're faced with issues of autonomy, identity, et cetera, domestic affairs. It really, um, it, it hasn't changed. Uh, there was a book that came out in 1861, I never heard of, we'll have to do more research on, but it is considered the first American courtesy book. And it was called East Lynn. L-Y-N-N-E, which tells the tale of a young girl gone wrong in the big city, and it became a staple of popular culture, which led me directly to Theodore Dreiser's sister, Carrie. And I'm wondering if this would fall in that same genre, Diane, I see that you're agreeing. Uh, we have to counter this type of writing with that of Emily Dickinson and Edith Wharton's, who um, demonstrate, um, you know, the difficulty of what happens uh, when you uh, strike out a, uh, against traditional standards. Because in at least in Wharton, I have yet to met a character who ends up happy at the end of that book. At least in this book, it's undone. We don't know. You know, it leaves it open. But in Wharton, you know, these poor women. Uh, yeah. All right. So um, a little bit about Mary now, if I may uh, now talk about the author, Mary McCarthy, and um, I will get to the Dick Cabot show, as Martha talked about um, at the beginning. This book took 18 years in the making. Uh, the uh, characters reveal themselves and they comment on one another and have interior dialogues. And this way, we um, uh, this is how we find out what's happening with each character. So it's not just one character, like in um, Seven Types of Ambiguity, if you were with us when we read that, where we just get the one point of view. From each character, we get to hear what's going on with all the other characters as well. Uh, a literary technique that Mary uh, uses is called ventriloquism. When you allow actions, words, and the intonation of each character to evolve as unique uh, without the voice of uh, the novelist or the omniscient narrator, uh, we don't hear from that. So um, it's just through their tone that we're kind of getting whether Mary likes this person um, or not. Um, in the early 1960s, um, her development of Kay as a dynamic uh, character rather than a static one uh, became the voice that she was looking for for so long. So, you know, she's working on the book through the 50s, and it was by the early 60s where she found it. She found Kay and could go forward with the book. Uh, it is a book with a lot of foreshadowing. Uh, right away, when we're in the pews, uh, we feel darkness. We feel the descent, as Diana said. We know this is not going to end well. We have no idea why. But it's being at the church at the beginning, we end up at the church at the end for the funeral. Um, we have... Um, outrageous sweeping generalizations that could have rubbed Phyllis the wrong way uh, that are throughout the book that people dislike, such as, quote, all the usual disorders of the repressed female brain. You know, so that could, um, you know, uh, put people off. Uh, she, it's her tone is also considered to be like a, a documentarian style of tone. Uh, the passages about her um, Dottie and what she goes through and what um, Chris goes through when she has her child and uh, her frustration and pain with breastfeeding, these are based on personal experiences of the author. She has a comic quality that to me is just hilarious. Uh, like I said, referring to the first, uh, the, the second chapter, what I'll call the fitting scene. I love how she includes recipes for pate, for cocktails, for the proper way to clean a dish rag. This to me is the stuff of life. Like I would read a whole book on uh, dishcloths and uh, their different fibers and where you bought them and who bought what where. Like that, I love that. Uh, even truly tasteful funeral arrangements, th these things are addressed. 
the book is a cautionary tale. It's a book of sexual awakening. There's a lot of loss metaphors, such as, you know, the loss of virginity and the loss of innocence that these girls, when they graduate from Vassar and they're so full of, you know, taking on the world and then life happens when they're confronted uh, with the real world. Polly eventually does recover from her affair with Gus uh, Lakey. Lakey is fully formed. She's probably the only one who seems like if I had to bet on most likely to succeed, it'd be Lakey because she's comfortable with her sexual identity. I think Noreen, Noreen she's just going to be a kvetch her whole life and an expert on everything. Uh, it is, uh, it's Kay who falls. Uh, it's Kay who takes the fall. Some book, some people uh, describe this book really as full of cliches, you know, as a negative. Uh, a little bit about women. Uh, there's a there's a shift in the way women think from the frivolity of the 1920s, post World War One. Let's just you know embrace life, come what come may, to the uh, 1930s where women are actually looking for meaningful relationships and personal fulfillment. This is a new way to find your mate. This is not how it was a generation uh, prior. Meanwhile, men are looking for space. Uh, they want freedom from their traditional roles. Remember, Harold goes out and buys a pickle for a recipe for Kay, and he disappears the rest of the night. Uh, addi additionally, as in every generation, we have children moving away from their parents' identity. And in this book, only to discover in some cases, oh my God, their parents weren't such idiots anyway. Uh, case in point, when Dot confronts her mother that she's had this sexual experience and she's in love with this, she's still in love with Dick, but she's engaged to this guy. Her mother doesn't faint or have the vapors. Her mother figures out, you know, how to, how to make this work. And all of a sudden Dot sees her mother in a whole new light. And a lot of, you know, mother, daughter, you know, parent sibling relationship at some level that happens you know they fall off the the pedestal but at some point you know they be they, you respect uh, the choices uh, that they made um there's a lot of themes about right and wrong good versus evil etc uh, i won't go into too much uh, detail on that but it is everywhere when i first read the book and um, learned about Polly and how she handles her husband, I mean, her father, who comes to live with her when he gets a divorce, a divorce in the 1930s, a divorce. And he starts acting manic, crazy. I wasn't sure what to make of it. Fast forward, when I read this book today, and this is what's so interesting about rereading books when you're older, I saw right away, right away in Polly's father that she was dealing with someone who was bipolar. And it gave me a whole new respect for Mary McCarthy because she treated his disease with dignity. When she talks about Kay, being checked in to the psych ward at the hospital by her husband and Kay not being able to be release herself of her own accord. That's like being Baker acted. That's like losing your autonomy uh, and, and feeling imprisoned. I, and so when Phyllis talks about prescient, Oh my gosh, you you absolutely nailed it. I, I had like all new respect for Mary McCarthy because she treats these um, mental um, illnesses with great tenderness and respect. And the incident with Kay is autobiog autobiographical for Mary. 
let me tell you now a little bit about Mary's life, which is worth a whole other um, college course of exploration. But I'll just try to hit on the, the, some of the high points. She had a charmed life from ages one to five. Uh, she explains her father as a charming alcoholic uh, who reformed and her mother who was beautiful. But I said to age of five, she was living in Seattle. Uh, she had an influential, wealthy family, graced by a rather romantic figure in her vibrant Jewish grandmother, Mary McCarthy, with her vibrant Jewish grandmother. Indeed, this is an American story. Her life was shattered by the flu epidemic. So uh, when the flu, uh, when the Spanish flu hits, she loses both her parents. She moves to Minneapolis, taken care of by relatives who pocket most of the funds. So it's she and her husband, uh, her, her, excuse me, her brother who moved to Minneapolis. Later in life, she accuses these family members of violently beating her on a daily basis and you can read about this in her book called Memory, uh, Memories of a Catholic Childhood that was published in 57. But Mary rapidly goes about reinventing herself and she gets into Vassar, not that you're surprised. She is an academic success. She escapes a difficult upbringing. In fact, in fact, I found out that an essay she wrote for the college entrance exam was published in the college entrance exam board journal in the early 1930s as an example of a high scoring essay. This is a smart girl, right? She's smart. In spite of the intelligence, in spite of it, she never feels fully accepted into the social elite milieu in which she found herself. Of course, none of you are surprised. She was a loner. She, um, while going to school, she demonstrated intense inter uh, interest in literature. Uh, depending on your source, when you, she graduates, either she had a lot of writing talent or she didn't. Uh, but when she graduates, she starts writing uh, book reviews for the nation and the New Republic, not that that should surprise you, and then goes on to have a series of affairs. Uh, she has a short marriage to, you guessed it, a theater director named Harold with an A, uh, jo Johns Rudd. Uh, then she has an affair with soon to be her next husband, who is the co founder of the Partisan Review, uh, the book, uh, the um, journal launched in 1934 by Communist USA, which was Marxist pro-Soviet um, at the time. Uh, but the, um, the review, as uh, Diana was explaining earlier on, it suspends its uh, writings in 1936 because they see what's happening uh, with um, Stalin, et cetera. Uh, so, um, you know, they uh, they kind of disband, but it is in this very feisty, uh, intelli uh, combative uh, intellectual environment that Mary hones her skills as a drama editor and critic. Uh, so um, she um, gets married again. Uh, now she has her own literary style and she marries a man in 1946 who actually like her loves gossip. So he often helped her supply background for scenes that would later become the group, uh, which I think is very fun. Uh, she starts writing and publishing in 1949. She comes up with a book in 52 called The Groves of Academe, which is another satire set in a liberal arts college for women. Uh, for women. Uh, and uh, she starts writing theater reviews, uh, uh, fiction, nonfiction, travel, art history. She's a Guggenheim fellow, not once, but twice. Uh, and by 1961, this is what is said about her uh, writing. 1961, okay? 
Mary McCarthy, the novelist, is a caretaker of American culture. So this was um, this was pulled from a, a study of nine novelists from the University of Minnesota Press. So that was 1961. 1962, what's published? The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan about the problem with no name. Okay. This uh, what happens in 63 when our book is published? Our book is published in January. By November, Kennedy has been assassinated. So what happens with her book in this context? It received a lot of advanced publicity. Men were questioning her ability to be a professional writer. Okay. Uh, Diana refers to a, a Norman Mailer quote that I'll get to. The book was called The Superficial Pot Boiler. Her circle of intellectual liberal friends were quick to disparage the book. She was at a dinner party in New York two months after its publication. I won't go into details like she would to describe the scene, but she bursts into tears when a fellow guest admits that he really didn't like it. She's hurt and puzzled when a close friend writes a mean-spirited satire in her partisan review. So I would say she has the Thomas Wolfe curse. If you read Look Homeward Angel, you'll know my references to when you write about people that you know, be careful because those people are going to read the book. So because she's so adept at fastening on to real life characters such as Harold with an A, people aren't happy because they recognize themselves and they're hurt by her sarcasm. They accuse her of outright, no, bitterness. They say it's old scores being settled. To them, it's all perilously, perilously close to naked contempt. In 2000, a biography about Mary McCarthy, uh, the author um, uh, asks her about the group. And the author actually interviews people that she feels the group was based upon. And one of her Vassar uh, alum said she was, quote, trying to make up for the fact that she always felt socially inferior. Eventually, Mary professionally is rejected. Why? It's the unintended consequences of the popularity of this novel. She's too popular. Therefore, all the smart people don't want anything to do with her because it's not cool. She is now a permanent outsider. Her old friends who weren't her friends don't like her. Her new friends don't like her. It's like, you know, you, you, can't, you can't win. In 1963, she told the New York Herald Tribune that the book had indeed resulted from, quote, putting real plums into an imaginary cake. So now let's look at how the world viewed our book, not in 2022, but in, in 1965, two years after the book comes out. It's entertaining, but disappointing. The central characters are sufficiently interesting or distinct from any other group. Profine, a profoundly feminine approach Social satire, Kay is presented as the only character who develops sufficiently to face her own failure. And here it is, 1966, from Norman Mailer, a man whose own writing did not shy away from graphic depictions of sexual acts. He dismisses the group and he criticizes Mary McCarthy for not reaching far enough, quote, he saw the novel's main characters as largely identical to the anachronistic 1950s values during the 1930s. Well, duh, he misses the point. He goes on to say, 
Her book fails as a novel by being good, but not nearly good enough. She's simply not a good enough woman to write a major novel. Mailer, he argued earlier, I'm just being fair, that her lesser well-known works showed greater promise, such as one I mentioned earlier, Memories of a Catholic Childhood. Again, I argue that this is a man who can't got, get out of his own ego because he totally misses the point. He's enraged by what he sees as women's submissiveness, but he cannot have like us the context to appreciate the social historian. He dismisses the fact, um, um, he says that the book fatally dismisses the fact that none of the characters has the power or dedication to wish or force events. He says it's uneven in its characterization, which people do complain about novels as being. Uh, and um, he, um, he wounds her and she was not expecting any of this negativity. Years afterwards, Mary McCarthy receives letters from irate readers accusing her of, quote, a perverted outlook on life. She's now shunned by everyone. It's so sad. However, however, because life is so weird for people who don't know her, for her readers, they love this book. They love the book. It's like the best thing ever, right? It rapidly becomes a book that everyone reads without wanting to admit it. Kind of like Fifty Shades of Grey, right? The book has always enjoyed more success with the public than its critics. This is not what she wanted. Be careful what you, when you put something out in the world. But this is what she gets. Why? Because readers can relate. This autobiographical nature um, of her writing, it created a sensation. In fact, it was banned in, not surprising, Italy and Ireland. Uh, and why? Well, you know, okay, I won't go into that, obviously. Uh, but these And Florida. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, these frank portrayals of sex, sexuality, virginity, birth control, conception, divorce, uh, every kind of intercourse, uh, uh, all of it, uh, it was just too much for some people. Uh, but it came at the right time. Remember, we're, we're with the feminine mystique has just come out as well. Uh, the explicit sexuality made it the most widely read uh, work uh, that she had. And it wasn't just the subject matter, all that's fun and hot and steamy, but what it was her attitude. It was the way she approached it. It was her wit. Uh, it showed that although women were nice girls, like Dottie, like Helena, they were adventuresome. They were curious. I loved this book because of this. Uh, our author then goes on to write books about Vietnam, Hanoi, Watergate. Uh, it's um, another um, uh, critic says of her work, her work is loyal to the life that she lived, that the mind's accomplishments are worth little in the face of life's difficulties. That's tough, but it's real. So in 1984, a writer asked her, was it worth it? Was the group worth it? She answers, to be disesteemed, which I didn't know was a word, to be disesteemed by people you don't have much respect for is not the worst fate, unquote. So it sounds like in 1984, she has come to own her autonomy and her respect, uh, the respect that Diana and my, myself would have for this book. But then 1989, she's again interviewed and the experience was still raw enough for her to admit in a newspaper interview that she thought the group had quote, 
ruined my life, unquote. That is so sad. That is so sad. But if you read the group, or if you know how the stories unfold in the group, it makes perfect sense. Uh, her, her prescience is absolutely amazing. In the 2000s, Candace Bushnell also said, I quoted her at the top, but I'll quote her again. It's a book I prize, not only for its blistering satire, but for its technical elements, including McCarthy's brilliant use of the soliloquy, her pacing, her razor sharp descriptions, unquote. And if you're not one for sex in the city or all that popular culture, I can go a wee bit highbrow with you. And I will quote Cromwell's Hillary Mantle. She describes the group as absorbingly funny, painful, a beautifully managed novel. I consider it a masterpiece. I wish I could have done that in her accent because she has the best voice. If you get a chance to watch any of her lectures, oh, you must. Okay, so um, like I said, there was the world's worst movie, The Group, in 1966 uh, that you can find on Prime. I really hope that wasn't um, slander. Okay, in my opinion, for legal reasons, I will say this is my humble opinion. Sydney, you could have done better. Um, in 2001, the group was broadcast on BBC Radio 4. And I'm going to hunt that down because that I'll listen to because I couldn't find this book on Audible. Um, it has also uh, showed up um, in other places. Um, if you are a fan of Liza Minnelli, um, there was a film she she did in 1969 called The Sterile Cuckoo. And the character of Pookie Adams was played by Liza Minnelli. And she is clutching a copy of the group when she departs the bus after her first encounter with her love interest. I love those Easter eggs. That is just so, so wonderful. So what is her literary legacy? Quote, she felt she had a kind of obligation to tell the truth as she saw it, said her son. She was a very meticulous chronicler, chronicler of the minor details of everyday life, what people ate, what they wore, what they drank. I think he's right. Mary exposes, quote, the acid of their intellect and of the intellectuality of the group, which seems to corrode their own humanity. I could go on and on about this book. Well, I could go on for about 10 more pages, but um, I think, uh, I guess, let me just wrap, let me wrap with this. Let's talk about Dick Cavett. In 1980, the playwright Lillian Hellman, and we read The Hour, filed a lawsuit, 2.2 mil, in damages against Mary McCarthy for libel on February 15th uh, of that year when she appeared on the Dick Cavett show. On said show, she called Hellman, quote, a bad writer, overrated, a, dis a dishonest writer. Evidently, the two had a long history of hostility dating back 30 years when the pair clashed publicly at a poetry seminar at Sarah Lawrence College. Tell me you do not want a time machine to go back and witness that. If anything else, just to hear the argument. Oh my goodness. Many writers and supporters of free speech rushed to McCarthy's defense. This is way before Kickstarter, including an heiress who picked up the $25,000 legal defense fees tab to save her from financial ruin. Helen died before the, Hellman died before the lawsuit came to trial and the suit was dropped. Is that life imitating her art, her art imitating her life? I just don't know. 
but I hope you walk away from this discussion uh, feeling some type of kindred spirit, whether it is a frustrated one or one of great homage to what Mary McCarthy has done for the American female voice. Thank you.